So anyway, it's, uh, it's really great to have Steve Cowley here uh, to give today's colloquium. Uh, Steve is a theoretical physicist with, uh, who, special, who specializes in nuclear fusion and in astrophysical plasmas. Um, he's, uh, he's held a startlingly large number of positions. He, uh, he was on the faculty at UCLA for many years, which is when I got to know him and become good friends with him. Uh, then he was on the faculty at Imperial College then he was on the faculty at Oxford, and now he's on the faculty at Princeton. He is currently the director of the Princeton Plasma Laboratory. Uh, when he was in England, he was president of Corpus Christi College at Oxford, which turns out also to be where he got his uh, BA. Uh, he was the head of Euroatom, and he was the CEO of the United Kingdom's Atomic Energy Authority. Um, he's received multiple honors. He's a fellow of the Royal Society. I I've ordered these. The fellow of the Royal Society, the Royal Society was founded in 1660. He was, a, he's a fellow of the Institute of Physics, which was founded in 1874. He was a fellow of the, a, he's a fellow of the APS, which was founded in 1899. And he's a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineers, which was founded in 1976. Um, his title today is something like Got Fusion. Uh, Fusion is important. It's, uh, it's important for our future. It's important intellectually. It's also something that is complicated by many emotional and political overturns, overtones. So it will be uh, very refreshing to hear some clear discussion of what we have in store. So anyway, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. You just remind me that I have trouble holding a job down. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Um, uh, the, let me share my screen and let's see if we can make the technology work. Um, and, uh, and how about this? Are you seeing the right screen? The screen, Steve, or should I swap the screen? Yeah. What was the answer? Yeah, me. Yeah, it's the Van Gogh. <laughs> it's, it's the Van Gogh. Okay. Um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 I, I'm going to tell a famous joke about uh, fusion research because otherwise somebody else will. And um, uh, people always say that fusion is 30 years away and always will be. Um, I, so that's a good way to start when we actually go back 100 years um, to the real birth of when uh, fusion uh, research started. It's actually almost exactly 100 years um, since Arthur Eddington gave his um, very famous presidential address to the British Association for the Advancement of Science on the internal consti constitution of stars. Um, if you have not read it, it it's online. It's a, it, it's a nature paper, which is probably verbatim what he actually said. Um, it's one of the great public um, speeches about science uh, that's ever been delivered because not only is it quite understandable um, to people with relatively little science knowledge, it's also, um, it breaks an incredible amount of new ground in just one paper. Um, I can't go through all of the things that he addresses here about the, um, the insides of stars. Um, but one of the key things, of course, was where does the energy come from that um, stars radiate? Um, it was an interesting question because, it, as he points out in this lecture, the, the, the prevailing theory at the time goes right back to Lord Kelvin in the um, 
two thirds of the way through the 19th century, when um, Kelvin said that stars, you know, are being heated uh, simply by collapsing and turning their gravitational energy into heat, and that heat um, and being radiated as as, as photons. Um, and Kelvin had actually estimated the age of the the sun at this point to be 20 million years, which uh, really did upset Darwin quite quite a lot because he saw it as a fairly convincing argument. Um, why um, the sun is only 20 million years old. And he thought the world of Kent was, um, was, was considerably older than that, maybe 300 million years. Um, so he was concerned uh, deeply about that. But Eddington in this, in, in this address points out that it, this can't be right. It can't be right that um, uh, the sun is only 20 million years old. And he goes through a, a, a bunch of arguments. Some of them are more plausibility arguments than anything else. Um, but there is enough of them that you're pretty darn convinced it can't be right. And then he says, well, if it's not right, why is the sun still shining um, at this point? <clears throat> and this is another aspect to this talk, which is amusing too, because one of the ways to make good progress in, in science is to be lucky. Um, and he was lucky because earlier that year, um, Aston had measured the masses of um, hydrogen and helium and concluded that the, um, the mass of hydrogen uh, was a, a bit more than one quarter the mass of helium. Um, and uh, he concluded from this that perhaps what the sun was doing was converting hydrogen into helium, and then there would be some mass left over. And of course, uh, one of the things we know about Eddington it was he's one of the earliest people to understand relativity, and he knew that if you were converting mass um, uh, into something else, it would be energy, and that would be the perhaps the binding energy of putting uh, four hydrogens together to make helium. It's remarkable that he did all of this because, of course, we knew very little about the the nucleus in, 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 in 1920. Um, and uh, his assumption was that the electrons were captured into, the, in, into this nucleus so as to make, you know, charge two helium, uh, two of the electrons were captured. And, um, but he could work out, obviously, just by taking the differences in masses, uh, how much energy is liberated uh, each time you convert four hydrogens into a helium. And from that, he went on to estimate, estimate that there was plenty of energy, as he said, in order to power the sun for 15 billion years, which in, you know, in these very approximate uh, arguments was a pretty good estimate uh, when it came down to it. Um, he also, in rather Victorian-type English, um, and made this statement um, that this reservoir, that's the uh, binding energy of the nucleus, can scarcely be other than the subatomic energy, which it is known exists abundantly in all matter. We sometimes dream that man, these were rather sexist ways, will one day learn how to release it and use it for his service. The store is well nigh inexhaustible, if only it could be kept. Um, so this is a hundred years ago, um, last August, the 24th, um, Eddington was saying these things. And the first attempts to think about um, making energy out of fusion um, was Fermi in, uh, uh, as far as we can see, although there was probably some talk before the war um, about this, but you know, how would you actually do controlled uh, fusion reactions to um, power, you know, to make electricity? And there is a, um, a talk by Fermi that was given in November of 1945 at Los Alamos. In November of 45 in Los Alamos, they decided that they would have a kind of demob conference of all the luminaries at, at uh, Los Alamos before they all trogged off to their universities. And of course, this conference, um, it was decided that there would, this would be a completely closed conference because they were going to talk about military things and nuclear weapons and various other things in this conference. And therefore no record of the conference was uh, officially kept. Um, but it was known some years later that at this conference Fermi talked about confining 
confining fusion fuel, deuterium in this case, um, with uh, magnetic fields at temperatures uh, hot enough to uh, induce fusion reactions um, in a talk at this conference. About, um, about six years ago, I got a call from a journalist in England who said, and I told him the story that Fermi was probably the person who started thinking about controlled fusion first. He said, um, I've got something for you. And he faxed me a copy of these notes from a guy called Philip Moon, who was at Los Alamos in 1945 as part of the British contingent in Los Alamos. And by, by November of 45, the British knew that we were going to lose access to the nuclear uh, secrets of, of Los Alamos. We'd had a, we'd had a scientific um, group at Los Alamos during that time, people like Piles and Chadwick and others had been there. Um, but the, U the US Congress was going to uh, pass the McMahon Act, which would shut Britain off from American nuclear secrets. And so we were collecting together as much information as we could to take back to England at that time. And so um, Philip Moon wrote this note on Fermi's lecture, which was uh, taken back to England um, uh, by uh, some, somebody in a diplomatic bag from the United States at that time. And this is the British spying on the Americans. And it was notes on um, Fermi's lecture. And at the end of this lecture, he talks about confining um, plasmas, very, very hot deuterium, um, it, it, to, in order to um, induce fusion reactions in the plasma and then have a controlled thermonuclear fusion reaction. Um, this, this actually copy of this report was declassified in the 50s, so I'm not showing you something you shouldn't see. Um, but it was in the papers of G.P. Thompson in, in, in Cambridge when it was found six years ago. Um, the key thing that, that Fermi had said at that time was you simply couldn't make a toroidal solenoid and make circular magnetic field lines in a toroidal solenoid and confine uh, a plasma um, for fusion purposes because the, the orbits of the particles would be the spiral orbit around the field line. But because of the curvature of the field line, this orbit would drift upwards or downwards depending on the sign of the charge um, and uh, drift out of your confinement regime. Um, and this was known at that time, and, and it was known as, as Fermi's theorem, um, which was kind of later. I don't know, somebody's not muted. Um, in 1951, um, it, around about the, the, the 50s, the, the American fusion program got started. This was Lyman Spitzer uh, in 1951 at Princeton started Project Matterhorn. Um, in, and Spitzer had some ideas about how to confine plasmas in magnetic fields in order to do uh, fusion um, in, a, in a plasma confined in a magnetic field at temperatures of uh, essentially hundreds of millions of degrees, tens of, tens of kilovolts. And he made a proposal in uh, July of 1951 to the Atomic Energy Commission to do this. But he had heard of uh, Fermi's theorem um, I'm told by the old timers at Princeton that he'd, he called it Fermi's theorem. Um, and he realized that the one way to get around Fermi's theorem was to bend the magnetic field into a figure of eight. And in the figure of eight, um, the drift up on one side of the figure of eight, say over this side here, would be canceled by a drift down on this side here, which would, uh, th that symmetry would allow him to keep the charged particles inside the magnetic field inside here and heat them to these immense temperatures at that time. I rather like this picture of uh, Spitzer in 1948 with a, with a slide rule. I don't think the students in the audience will know what a slide rule really is. Um, it's a very characteristic pose that you, uh, of the time, even when I started as a student, uh, with piles of um, open, open books, um, is rev, whatever it is there, and, and a slide rule, and you don't see that very much anymore. This was the early history of, of, of fusion. And we're going to come back to this because I think some of Spitzer's ideas um, at that time are, are coming now to be some of the best ideas that are coming out in fusion. Um, so <clears throat> I always give uh, talks 
a bit like James Bond movies. The, uh, the, first, the first few slides are a teaser, and then we come to the titles at this point. And this is the point you see the, the gun on the screen and the, the blood dripping down the screen. Um, fusion research in, uh, in this country and around the world is a bit in, in a transition. Um, we're expecting um, a second report from the National Academy of Sciences in the next, uh, in, on the 17th of February uh, to talk about um, planning to build a fusion pilot plant in the United States. Um, this was first uh, mooted in, a, in a, a, a report about two, two years ago uh, from the National Academy where they said that there was technology such that we could probably actually make a plant that would produce some electricity from fusion um, but around about the 2040s, sometime like that. I know that's 30 years away and the joke is, is, is on me. Um, it, one of the questions is, are we ready to do that? What, what innovations are needed now in order to be able to make a fusion plant in, in the future? future? And one of the, the questions that I think is really poorly understood, it's even poorly understood just for conventional nuclear power stations, is what really sets the cost of this? And can we make fusion reactors that actually make electricity at a cost that the consumer wants to pay? Um, there are a lot of mistakes that you can make in this. Um, and it's clear that at the moment, fission is pricing itself out of the market for all kinds of reasons. Um, some of them I think we should correct because I think fission is going to be very important in reaching um, decarbonization of our energy supply. But um, I'm, it's very important that, that, that fusion doesn't make some of the mistakes that, that fission has made in terms of um, setting out in the wrong directions. Because um, obviously talking to my friend Steve Kivelson, <clears throat> superconductors are a very important thing. And in fact, in, in magnetic fusion, magnetic fusion simply wouldn't be possible without a superconducting magnets. Without that, the power that you would have to put to make the magnetic field would be just uh, inconceivable um, uh, loss of power and make it very, very hard to make fusion possible. And so the, the, the magic of superconductors is, is very important. And the question, of course, is that is that magic uh, going to get better um, and will high temperature superconducting magnets where we can go to higher fields make things easier, smaller, faster, cheaper and, and get to the end uh, faster. I'm going to talk about that issue uh, in some detail as I go through the talk because um, there are some problems with that but there's obviously some great promise of that too. Um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is revisiting the ideas that spits ahead because they're inherently three-dimensional ideas. Ideas that I think are coming to their time, partly because we understand, um, we understand chaos, we understand stochasticity, we understand the motion of particles in three-dimensional fields much better. Um, and we may be able to design three-dimensional uh, fusion reactors that are a whole lot better than two-dimensional ones. Um, let's um, move on to the... The next slide. Um, when Eddington was talking about taking four hydrogens and turning them into helium, he of course didn't really understand the steps that you have to go through in order to take four hydrogens and turn them into helium. He didn't need to in order to derive how much energy that would, would yield. Um, um, but in fact, you know, um, fusing hydrogen to hydrogen is extraordinarily hard and very low cross section, involves the beta process and, and, and is not something we intend to do to generate um, fusion power. There is one fusion reaction that by far is the, is the um, easiest one to do, and that's between deuterium and tritium, um, two isotopes of hydrogen. Um, and deuterium is heavy hydrogen and it's, uh, it's plentiful in seawater. There's enough uh, deuterium in seawater to power the planet for 60 billion years. Um, and uh, tritium, which is super heavy hydrogen that doesn't exist in nature and has a half-life of 12.4 years. Um, th th it's th partly the easiest uh, fusion reaction to do because of course the, they're only, uh, they only have charge one. Um, and therefore the Coulomb repulsion between 
deuterium and tritium is the least um, of any Coulomb repulsions that you can have. Um, and in order to get, of course, the deuterium and tritium together, you have to get over that Coulomb repulsion and close enough that the strong force will bind the nucleus. And the DT, deuterium tritium reaction, goes via a compound um, helium-5 nucleus and an excited state at about 104 kilovolts. It's a J3 half state of the um, helium-5 nucleus that's uh, only metastable um, and very short-lived. Um, it kicks out helium-4, uh, a normal isotope of he helium, uh, with an energy of 3.5 megavolts, and a neutron, which is a tank shell of a neutron, 14 MeV neutron. Um, this cross-section of this is about uh, five barns at um, uh, energies of about 40, uh, 40 kilovolts. So it's really the easiest fusion reaction to do by far. And we, uh, almost everybody who's trying to do fusion uh, is aiming at this reaction being the first step along the way. It, unfortunately, it's sort of God's little joke that um, the easiest fusion reaction to do involves an isotope that doesn't uh, stay around for very long, only 12.4 years. And you get tritium um, from lithium by bombarding lithium um, and then splitting the lithium into helium-4 and tritium. So tritium is not really the fuel. The fuel is lithium and deuterium. Uh, this is the reaction with lithium-6, uh, which is only 7% of, of naturally occurring uh, lithium. But there is a reaction with lithium-7, which is also. So any fusion reactor has to have um, a plasma at a temperature something like uh, 200 million degrees, where the deuterium and the tritium are running around, banging into each other. Most of the time, they just... They just bounce off each other, these glancing blows. But every now and again, they get close enough that a fusion reaction takes place and releases the energy um, in the form of the kinetic energy of the helium, the kinetic energy of this neutron that comes out. Um, so that's the general scheme that people are um, interested in doing. Now, actually, we've done this. Um, oh, I should say that uh, you have to have a plasma with deuterium and tritium at something like 200 million degrees. And then you have to have a blanket surrounding your system containing your lithium, where you're going to breed your tritium uh, from the lithium and take that tritium and put it back into your reactor um, in, this, uh, in this cycle. There's enough lithium in the sea to supply the, uh, the Earth's um, world energy needs, all of world's energy needs for about 30 million years. Um, so there's just really plentiful supply of the fuels here. Um, obviously, the biggest problem and the one that everybody's focused on is how do you hold a plasma at 200 million degrees? Um, the, this has been done, um, and it was done in experiments in the 1990s, both at Princeton and at Cullum, um, part of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, in the joint European tourists in 1997. Um, in this uh, blue trace over here, this is fusion power on the left and seconds along the bottom. For one and a half seconds, we took the, uh, the fusion power up to just over uh, 16 megawatts. And you'll see that this wasn't entirely successful in the sense that the plasma terminated itself rather rapidly at the end of that 16 megawatt burst. Um, this is the, these two machines, TFDR at Princeton in the 90s and JET at, uh, at Cullum in, in the UK, are the only two machines that run with tritium fuel um, ever. Um, this discharge, the red one in JET, is more like the kind of controlled bring up the fusion power to about 4.5 um, megawatts of fusion power and then close it down at the end of the discharge. Um, jet cannot run at full power for more than about five seconds. And so that was a, a, a relatively controlled uh, fusion uh, performance there. In order uh, to get jet to produce 16 megawatts of fusion power, they were injecting in the form of neutral particles 24 megawatts of power to keep the plasma hot. This was not a self-sustained fusion burn at that time. 
and then we have not seen a controlled self-sustained fusion burn anywhere. And that, those experiments in the 1990s caused the world to turn around and say, well, how do we actually get to a fusion burn? The decision in the United States at that time was, you know, maybe we should do this internationally and we should do this with international partners in, in an international experiment. And this was a, the ITER experiment that's now being built in, in, in France. This was a bit of a blow. It was a blow to Princeton because, you know, we, we had one of the only machines at that time that had actually got some fusion power just over 10 megawatts in 1994. Um, it essentially that uh, the fusion program was not going to be in the United States the next stage. The US did not build a bid on ITER at that time. ITER's coming along. Um, this is basically double the size of JET. If you make your plasma bigger, the leakage of heat from the plasma will, will be less and the fusion heating will be more. And maybe we can get to a stage where when each time you have a fusion reaction, you release a neutron that escapes the magnetic field, but you release a helium nucleus, an alpha particle, that is uh, moving much faster than the plasma particles, collides with the plasma particles, gives up its energy to the plasma, and heats the plasma. That self-heating of the plasma would cause self-sustainment of the plasma. And that's really the goal that everybody set um, in fusion research after the results in the 1990s. So here's the ITER site a few months ago. Um, the ITER itself will be right here, um, sitting, it'll be a, a toroidal donut shaped device um, right here in, in which the um, plasma is contained in a toroidal solenoid, you'll see in a moment. Um, this is the assembly hall. These the, are these the cryo plants, are, uh, Cry plant, no, cryo plant is over this side here. This is the power supplies, etc. here. It is a massive operation. And the cost of this operation is, is around about 20 billion um, to make this happen. Um, here's a picture of, of uh, a CAD drawing of, of, of ITER. These coils here create a solenoidal magnetic field that goes around this loop. This glowing thing is supposed to be where the plasma is. It's a donut shaped piece of plasma contained by the 15 mega amps, million amps going around this circuit. And because light currents tr attract each other, the two sides of that column carrying this, the, the 15 million amps attracts itself and pulls itself off the wall. Um, and that provides the, the pinch force that holds against the seven atmospheres of pressure, which this plasma at fusion temperatures in the middle is pushing out on this magnetic field here. The field that's being produced by these niobium tin superconducting magnets here, which are 12 meters tall um, here, is about five Tesla right there and about 12 Tesla, 11.8 Tesla, right on the inside of the magnet right there. Um, this is a phenomenal piece of, uh, of technology, and it's being built all over the world, including uh, the central solenoid, which you can see right here, which induces the voltage around this loop, which is being built in San Diego by General Atomics right now. This is an incredible uh, experiment, but it's an experiment. It's not a reactor. It will produce no electricity from it at all. Um, and it's interesting to see what predictions of the simulations suggest for this. And then you'll understand just a little bit about, you know, what the goal is here. Um, so along the bottom here um, is, is, is time in seconds. And so when you start up a, an eta plasma, those great big uh, toroidal field coils making the solenoidal field going around the torus, the toroidal solenoid, uh, they're on already. And then you fire, you change the flux through the middle of the donut, and this induces the current in, in a plasma. Um, and the plasma then heats up to about a kilovolt in temperature during this time early on right here. Um, that 15 million amps flows around that circuit and the 
and what we call ohmic heating, which is the resistive heating of that current going around that loop, heats it up to a few kilovolts. But at this point right here, this brown um, splodge here is the heating power turning on. And it's, it, it turns out at 70 megawatts of, of um, uh, microwave power is beamed into the plasma at that time. This takes the central temperature of the plasma up to about 23 kilovolts, at which point the fusion reactions start to happen. It gets very sensitive above about five, five to 10 kilovolts, you'll start to see fusion reactions. What you see here, and I'll concentrate on scan two for the moment, the blue line, is that you turned on this power and up goes the, the fusion power coming out of it. So you've got about 500 or so megawatts of fusion power coming out of your plasma. Then at this point here, you step down your input power, your microwave power, down to about 50 megawatts of power. And you'll see here some relaxation of oscillations in the middle of the plasma causes the fusion power to go up and down. Those are some uh, instabilities of the plasma in the middle, which I'm not going to describe, um, but we think we understand them well enough to be able to simulate them for ETA discharges. Then at this point here, 400 seconds, you turn off the fusion power. Now, when you've got 500 megawatts of fusion power, one fifth of that is coming out as alpha particle energy, and so is deposited in the plasma. So in fact, most of the heating during this time that the microwaves are on is actually coming from the fusion itself at this point. And the fusion is giving something like 100 megawatts of, of, of heating power to the plasma. In, scan, in the case of SCAM2, you turn off that heating power and you get a self-sustained fusion burn. Um, it continues to give out fusion power. We're not putting any power into the plasma we're sustaining the current with a voltage around that loop and it's burning away, producing 500 megawatts of power with essentially zero input power at that time. If this happens in, in ITER, it'll be um, really a very successful experiment. Um, but one of the things that's worrying um, in all things is that our models are not very exact. Um, this plasma is highly turbulent. There are lots of elements of the boundary conditions that we, we are not completely sure that we understand. And so what this fellow Bob Budney did uh, on these things was to tweak the standard models in various different ways. Here's an interesting one, scan four, which is when you produce the fusion reaction between the deuterium and tritium, you obviously make this alpha particle, that's helium. And that's ash, that's the fusion ash. It's what's left over after the fusion things. If that accumulates in the plasma, you choke off the fusion reaction. And in scan four, he turned off the diffusion of the helium out of the system and gradually the ash accumulates and the fusion, the fusion fire goes out, if you like. Um, so that was one case. Scan one is also a rather disappointing one, which is where he changed the boundary conditions. And you can see, although it gives, you know, 200, 300 megawatts of fusion power, when you turn off the input power, it goes out. Um, so the, the, the ITER experiment, uh, which will begin around 2025, 2026, is, is hopefully a demonstration of you know, fusion being able to actually be self-sustained and an experiment. But I have to say, my conclusion from this device is that this is going to be a great experiment and we'll learn a lot from it. Um, but engineering this into a commercial reactor has a lot of downsides. It's very big, it's very expensive, it's very complex. And, you know, are we going to be able to produce electricity at a cost the consumer wants to consume um, in, in a device like this? Um, so there is a big push to... And, uh, but before before you go on, can I, can I just ask you a question? So the, the 500 megawatts sounds like a very small amount for something that scale. I mean, is that something which, if one had to guess how big you would need to get something to be in the multi-gigawatt several so gigawatt scale, they'd have to scale up or are there other limitations that are um, what's making this particular, the estimate being um, 500 megawatts? Um, 
Well, fusion is very nonlinear. So if you go up in scale about 10%, 20%, you're up at about three gigawatts, which would suggest, you know, here's the size of a person, right? Uh, three, three gigawatts of fusion power would produce about one gigawatt of, of electricity. So it's a bit large for a power station, but not completely out, out of sight. I think one of the things that makes it so expensive if we go back will be all these peripherals. A big cryo plant here. This cryo plant is a 30 megawatt cryo plant to power those niobium tin um, uh, superconducting magnets. Um, and you have to cool them down to below four degrees K. Uh, so that kind of, uh, recycling power that you have to put through that cryo plant in order to do that is part of the downsides of, uh, of this um, route at this point. Eta is actually just jet times two. Um, it doesn't involve many of the innovations that the science in, in fusion research has brought over the years. And it is very big and I agree with you that you know 500 megawatts from something this size is not it's only 500 megawatts of heat and not electricity. Um, so it is, that, that is concerning. However, it's not supposed to be a reactor. It's supposed to be an experiment to look at a fusion burn. We've never made one. We've never made it happen. Frankly, if we make a fusion burn before I die, I'll be very happy. Um, sounds a bit dramatic, really. Um, let, let's, let's go a little bit to what sets the scale of, of fusion plants. And, and, and probe at this question of do we really have to make something that's that big? Um, here we have uh, a rather standard formula for what the fusion power uh, per meter cubed of a plasma in the temperature range 70 to 200 uh, million degrees centigrade. This is the pressure of the plasma squared in atmospheres. So typical plasmas that we make in, in ITER might be seven atmospheres. Um, and so this is 49 and it's times about 0.1. So it's about 4.5 megawatts per cubic meter um, as, a, as a power density inside your device. Um, now, in order to confine the plasma, you have to hold that pressure of the plasma. By the way, there's only a few tenths of a gram of deuterium and tritium making all of this pressure because it's at such immense temperatures you have to have the pressure in the magnetic field uh, to push on it. And again, in handy dandy units, the magnetic pressure is sort of 4b squared in Tesla, in, in, again in atmospheres. Um, we have a figure of merit for confining plasmas, which is the pressure of the plasma, this is the kinetic pressure of your deuterium and your tritium, divided by the magnetic pressure that you're pushing on it, and it's called beta. And typically, a few percent is good. We never really got to the point where the magnetic field, you know, balancing the pressure can be stable. Um, we have to have a lot more magnetic pressure, and it mostly balances itself. Um, so your fusion power, if you take this parameter beta, is proportional to your magnetic field to the fourth power. And it's obviously a huge gain to be made if you can double your double your magnetic field strength. When ITA was designed, the best um, superconductor to use to make its uh, toroidal field coils were niobium tin. And even that was in development stages at, 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 in, the, in the early 90s when they first started mooting that this was going to be how they were going to build it. And so, you know, the maximum field that they were thinking of at the, at the superconductor was about 12 Tesla. Um, people are now uh, mooting that we might be able to double that. And so 16 times the fusion power density in your device. So you can go up a considerable amount in that time. Of that fusion power, one fifth of it is the self-heating power of fusion. It's, it's what comes out as the alpha particles. And so you can see that the self-heating power of the fusion um, is something that we want to maximize because we don't want to have to inject power to get fusion back. We'd like it to be totally self-sustaining. We don't want to have to make electricity and take some of that electricity and, and put it back into the device. So in order to understand the performance of these things, you really only need two parameters. 
One of them is this parameter beta, which I can, I'm just going to by fiat tell you we can get a few percent. And in really advanced devices like the one at General Atomics, maybe 20, 25 percent. Um, much better than ITER, but you know, um, it's, it's a parameter. The other one is what we call the energy confinement. Inside these plasmas, uh, sound waves are unstable. Um, we're in a temperature gradient in which the middle of the plasma might be at you know, 25 kilovolts and the wall is at a few EV. Um, and so that huge temperature gradient across there uh, destabilized sound waves that are very elongated along the magnetic field lines. We know this because we scatter microwaves off these plasma fluctuations inside here. We've looked at the characteristics and now, as you can see in this picture, we have huge <coughs> numerical <coughs> simulations of this turbulence. Um, and it's, they're getting to be pretty accurate simulations of what goes on. But actually the characteristics of, these of this turbulence is very, very simple. The typical eddy size here, the size of one of these blobs, and these blobs, uh, the flow of plasma is along constant color. So this is like looking at streamlines in a, in, a, in a stream. These are little rolls taking hot plasma out and cold plasma in, hot plasma out, cold plasma in. And the typical radial size of this is a llama radius of, a, of an ion, of a deuterium ion in, in the magnetic field. And so you can get the rough scaling of one of these turbulent eddies. And if you assume that what turbulence does is essentially a random walk from the middle to the outside, you know the step length of the random walk is the llama radius of an ion. And you have a certain number of steps in order to get the distance from the middle to the outside, which is roughly this radius um, there. And so the number of steps you have to make, turbulent steps you have to make from the middle to the outside is, uh, is essentially a, a measure of, of how big your plasma is. Um, and on ITER, um, the number of steps typically the turbulence will have to make is about a million. This is very small scale turbulence. That's really most of, of what fusion research has done over 50 years is to make the turbulence smaller and smaller and smaller, but not zero. It, it turns out we've never been able to have a plasma that doesn't have turbulence in it. So this is, the, this is, this is how you estimate the step size. You take the, you take the size of the machine and you divide by the llama radius and you square it. Well, what about the time it takes uh, um, to make that random walk? You know, what one step length that's going round one of these eddies once. That turns out, sorry, that turns out to be the typical frequency of these sound waves. And they're elongated around the machine. So it's the frequency of a sound wave that goes once around the machine, has a wavelength of, uh, along the magnetic field of about once around the machine. And from that, you can work out the typical eddy turnover time in this device. And that's the size of the device divided by the thermal velocity of the ions or the sound velocity is about the same. And so the energy confinement time is the time it takes heat to work its way from the middle to the outside. So it's the number of steps times the time it takes to make a step. And you can work that out as being proportional to the magnetic field squared times the radius cubed times the temperature of the minus three halves power. Well, in fusion, this temperature has to be about 20 kilovolts. So that's roughly a constant in all your devices. This is how the energy confinement time scales <coughs> with size and the magnetic field. Again, you can see bigger things. It takes longer to go from the middle to the outside and stronger magnetic field makes the llama radius smaller and the eddy size is smaller. And so that is a, is a big win, win in that direction. Oh, sorry, it's not doing this. So if you look at and now the self-heated plasma is where that alpha energy, the self-heating, is matched by the loss due to this turbulent process. You can get this balance of the self-heating versus the turbulent losses, right? And that in order for that um, alpha particle heating to be bigger than the turbulent losses, you get this criterion on the magnetic field and the size. Now, there's lots of details. The shape of the plasma matters, the profiles matter, 
and everything else like that matters. But fundamentally, the predominant part of what we can control as engineers building the devices is the size of the magnetic field and the size of the plasma. And this scaling law holds remarkably well for all the devices that we've ever built. Um, it's called Jaro Bohm after David Bohm, who first introduced this kind of turbulent transport um, before he did, or maybe after he did things in, in solid state physics. Um, and it's the, it's the standard scaling that we get. So there's a sort of self-similarity. If you wanted to actually get to fusion, you've got to either, in, from where we are now, you've got to either increase the magnetic field or increase the size. ETA did the thing that it increased the magnetic field as much as it could in, in, in designs that were done, frankly, in the middle of the, of the 1990s, uh, um, and then made the, the machine big enough that it would get to this burning state where it was self-heated. And although there are other small factors in this, this is fundamentally the scaling that was done, although obviously there was a lot of computer simulations, et cetera, to back all this up. Um, and there are two devices really moving forward now to actually producing a burning plasma, a self-heated plasma. Here's ETA on the left um, with niobium tin technology producing these orange field coils right here. Um, and uh, actually, um, I think you can't see them, but there are, there are, there are coils going the long way around. I think the, this one's here, this one here, this one here. Those are actually niobium titanium superconductors. <clears throat> but um, people soon realized that one of the advantages of high temperature superconductors is that you could probably go to larger magnetic fields. And would this help us? <coughs> So um, this device, Spark, has been proposed by a company out of MIT called Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Um, um, and it's, here's a picture of it on this side. And this is the size of a person compared to Spark. This radius from here to here in ETA is 6.2 meters. This radius from here to here in, um, in Spark is supposed to be 1.78 meters. The field in ETA is 5.3 Tesla in the middle right there. The field right there in Spark is 12.5 Tesla, and the field right on the magnet here is 23 Tesla. That's equivalent to 2,500 atmospheres of magnetic pressure on the coil at that point, two and a half times the pressure at the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, they both have B times R to the three quarters, roughly equal to 20. And they both project performance. The performance projected for Spark is very similar to the performance projected for ETA. However, the um, uh, YBCO technology of these magnets is under development. Um, nobody's made high temperature superconducting magnets that are something like two to three meters tall uh, in, the, in this case. Um, it's about three meters tall, I think, the, the typical. Um, coil in this case. Um, but it is an in a very interesting uh, step forward because it cer certainly shows we could do things that are smaller. It's not that clear that it'll be a lot cheaper because a whole bunch of the cost here is not just in the magnetic self, it's in the cryogenic system, it's in all the other things. And uh, you still have to cool these high temperature superconductors down to sort of below 20K, um, but maybe not to the 4K that you have to do for the niobium tin. Is it cheaper because it's smaller? It's not clear. It may be cheaper to build the, the core of the fusion device, but a lot of the expense will not be in the fusion device itself. As it is in fission, it'll be in what we call the balance of plant coming out of that. Um, there are problems with this, and there are problems associated with going to very high power densities like this. Because the field here is, is doubled, um, more than doubled in this case, then the fusion power densities have gone up, you know, like a factor of 15, 16 in this case. Um, and that means that the exhaust power coming out of your plasma is very large. And it also means that it's the danger of instability becomes really problematic and may actually, if you have an instability, you may melt the walls of your device. 
And this gets into what happens when we do have instabilities in, in these. You've got 15, in ETA, you've got 15 million ants going around in that circle. If you interrupt that 15 million ants, you'll get a huge voltage um, and you can accelerate particles to immense en energies. And indeed, in our devices, that's what happens. So when you have an instability in these cases or a chip of stuff falls off the wall into your plasma and suddenly cools your plasma from that temperature down to a lower temperature, what happens is we see a beam of highly relativistic electrons being, being pulled out, carrying most of the current that used to be carried by the plasma is now carried by 10, 50, 100 megavolt electrons going around the circle. When they strike the wall, they cause damage, like you can see on this left-hand side. This is a beryllium tile on, on jet that in, in which a beam of, of megavolt electrons had hit the tile. Um, in the past, those megavolt electrons have actually bored holes into the water cooling pipes on jet and, and, and caused serious damage to the, uh, uh, to the device. Um, on, the, on the right, you're seeing the um, hard X-ray image of that, that, that beam of, uh, of very um, energetic electrons going around. Understanding this just uh, briefly it would be sort of, um, you can see in a jet pulse like this, that just look at this top trace here. This is the current in the plasma. And at this point here, something happens that causes the plasma to start radiating uh, uh, several hundred megawatts of uh, radiation. Um, and in, th in this case, it was an instability. The plasma hit the wall, crap came off the wall, came into the plasma, it starts radiating. The plasma cools down very rapidly. As it cools, the resistance to the plasma gets larger. And then the voltage around the loop, by Lenz's law, goes up. And what happens at that time is that the current starts to drop but as the current starts to drop, the voltage starts to go up. And what happens is you get a current in the runaways that replaces the current in the plasma. And you get a plateau of current of runaway electrons at about 100 MeV flowing in your plasma. Um, this 15 mega amps of such 100 MeV electrons in ETA will be a problem. And they're coming up with all kinds of mechanisms to terminate um, that beam by throwing uh, in frozen pellets in, in, in its path um, at this point. Um, understanding this, and I don't, I'm, I'm running out of time a little bit, just understand what happens to an electron in the plasma. An electron moving in a plasma feels a friction from the other electrons. As it's moving along, there's collisional friction. And that friction rises as you push the electron away from zero velocity. But it reaches a peak at about the thermal velocity of the electrons. And above that, it drops. And so if you apply an electric field to that plasma, there are two points, the electrons right here, where the electric field is balancing the friction. Uh, there's this point over here, which is an unstable fixed point. Whereas if the electron is moving faster than that, the friction is too little to cause it just to be accelerated to these highly MeV uh, energies. And that's called a runaway process. And it was discovered in Los Alamos in the 1950s by a guy called Harry Dreiser um, at that time. And it's known if you just apply a very large electric field to a plasma, you'll get this runaway of the electrons inside the plasma. What happens though in, in these plasmas is there's almost no electrons up at this energy, right? This second unstable fixed point. So, you don't see runaways at the normal electric fields of a typical fusion device. But now what happens if you suddenly cool the plasma is that the electron distribution gets lots of cooled electrons around here. The friction goes up here. Um, and because the friction goes up, in order to carry the current, the electric field has to rise inductively. And what happens then is the electric field rises inductively and you're left with some, some electrons that are left over at high energies in this runaway area. And those electrons, these green colored electrons here are the ones that run away. And that's what produces those huge uh, uh, runaway um, disruptions in total mass. We can't have more than a few in ETA without really causing major damage to the device. Um, 
So is this something that's going to go on in all fusion devices um, is, is a real question. Um, and the question is, can we get around this by going to these high fields? Actually, no, unfortunately, it gets worse by going to smaller devices with higher field. Um, let's take our scaling, which is B times R to the three quarters is equal to a constant. The energy in the runaways is roughly the energy stored in the, in the uh, magnetic field caused by the current. This is the, what we call the poloidal magnetic field inside a tokamak. And that energy scales like the square of the magnetic field times the volume, R cubed. And it's about a gigajoule in ETA, that stored energy. Um, and, uh, but then ask, OK, if I put this scaling in, that energy actually goes down. The total amount of energy goes down in these high field devices like Spark. Um, but the, the unit, the area of the wall also goes down. So we divide by R squared to get the scaling of the, of the energy in the beam of, of megavolt electrons per unit area of the wall. And as we make smaller devices, that gets worse. And it's roughly two times worse in, in the MIT machine than it would be in ITER. Um, if you scale this to fusion reactors, it's a bit of a problem. And it's the problem of carrying very large currents inside your plasma. And it made me feel, really feel that we have to seriously look back at, at Spitzer's ideas from 1951 and the 1950s. Spitzer decided that machines should not carry currents. And that you could make, you could make a, a, a magnetic field that didn't have the problem that Fermi came up with, that the particles just drifted out of it. If you twisted the magnetic field around itself, by the external coils that were twisted. He made a figure of eight to start with, and then he abandoned the figure of eight and went to helical windings around his plasma. And largely in the US, we abandoned this in the 1970s, but the Germans pursued it. <laughs> and using supercomputers in the 1990s, they, they designed a field configuration that would actually confine the, the, the particle orbits extremely well but with immensely complicated sets of superconducting coils. Um, in this picture on the right-hand side, you can see those coils in blue and the shape of the plasma in this sort of orange. It, this, it, it, uh, on the computer, they optimized the shape over many, many iterations and, and, and to get the, the properties that you see here. It was a very clever piece of work. And then they built the, the device. It was about a decade late, but they built it in, uh, in, in Greifswald on the Baltic coast, it's called W7X. And here's a picture in 2013, and it had its first plasma in 2015. And it's just, it hasn't yet got up to full power, uh, but it's producing really ex excellent results uh, from this machine. And it carries no current. So it can't, it can't have this catastrophic instability situation before. But one thing you can definitely see, is here's your superconducting coils inside. This is the cryostat here that um, surrounds the superconducting coils. And the helium lines is like, you know, you're like you're knitting a, a sweater inside this a device. Unbelievable piece of engineering. And, and they brought it to fruition um, late, but, but, but remarkable engineering. And, and, and it is a, a remarkable device. Um, the next but it's not the end of the story because people have been thinking about how do you really optimize a three-dimensional field to confine plasmas? Because we don't just want to confine the orbits of the particles. We want to have, we have, have as little turbulence as possible inside here. And so now applying our turbulence codes to this, we can start to optimize, not just for the confinement of the orbits of the particles, but also the generation of turbulence inside this. And that we've come up with some weird and wonderful shapes of our plasmas that, that, get, that, that give us really good confinement out of this. This is not just, you know, optimizing a computer over many, many ones. There's been some beautiful theorems about how to search for hidden invariants in the Hamiltonians of the particles, where there's hidden symmetries to the magnetic field. You wouldn't think that this particular field here had any symmetry. But when you see it in certain coordinates, it has a very pronounced helical symmetry in which there is an ignorable co coordinate. And therefore in the Lagrangian, 
you have a, a, a conserved quantity and, and that conserved quantity guarantees single particle confinement. Um, this quasi-symmetry, which was invented by Alan Boozer in 1983, um, now we're, we're finding devices that not only have a quasi-symmetry, but also um, have very low levels of turbulence. But there's a problem. And that is that the engineering of this device, these devices looks really hard to do. Um, and this is something I thought would, would my last uh, topic here. The difficulty here is making those superconducting coils that are bent and wiggled and, and, and in, in, in weird and wonderful shapes. It's not, it's hard, but it's not difficult to imagine making planar coils like these blue ones you see on this side. Um, and they can be adjusted to provide almost all of the field. But one of the remarkable things about the new permanent magnets, well, they're not so new, the neodymium uh, permanent magnets is that they're very hard. And so you can put them inside the fields produced by these coils and use them to trim up the field to make these weird and wonderful uh, shapes. This was Matt Landerman, who's at the University of Maryland, had, had done an optimization of making one of these exotic configurations um, here, where you would use um, uh, superconducting, high temperature superconductors to produce the majority of the field in a set of planar coils that are thin and each one individually cryostatic. And then these magnetic, uh, then these exotic part of the magnetic fields produced by layers of permanent magnets between the green surface and the yellow surface right here. Um, <clears throat> perhaps this is a way to to cheaply make the fields in these devices, which look like they might make a very good pilot plant at some point. So we went out and asked DOE for some money and we've got some money from ARPA-E to make permanent magnet arrays to see how well and how precisely we can actually make these permanent magnets. And we have some leftover coils from a device that we never finished at at, at Princeton and a vacuum vessel and, and uh, we're proposing and trying to raise money from foundations at the moment to build one of these uh, exotic quasi-symmetric devices uh, with a combination of these permanent magnets and in this case copper coils but if we can get some money we're going to buy some high temperature superconducting coils to do this. Um, in principle this makes a very interesting pilot plant. Um, we should try to get fusion by the middle of the century. I believe to decarbonize our energy system, we're going to need what people are calling firm energy sources like fission, um, ones that you can switch on and switch off. I also believe that we'll need to replace once through fission um, sometime in this century um, and fusion would be an ideal way to do that. Um, it is a hundred years since Eddington said fusion might be a way to power the planet. Um, it's going to be at least a couple more decades before we can make any electricity. There's certainly some innovation that's needed. Um, I think superconductors and permanent magnets are going to be at the center of that innovation. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Uh... I guess people can unmute themselves to to applaud, or <laughs> maybe there are symbols. Yay! Um, good. Are there questions? Let's see. Um, I don't know how questions are supposed to be handled. Um, Raise hands. What? Somebody's raising a hand. Somebody's raising a hand. Okay. Uh, Fedja. Yes, hello? Yes. Hold on, let me turn the hand on. Okay. Hi. Um, so I'm really, so first off, uh, Professor Cowley, thank you so much for the very interesting um, presentation. Um, I'm really glad that, that you're doing well, um, especially given the difficult times that we're in. And not sure if you remember me, but um, we met about two years ago. You gave a talk at Texas A&M University. So, it's, it's, I'm really glad that there is progress in this very interesting field. Now you remind me I do, but I didn't before, I'm sorry. Oh, it's, it's okay, thank you. Um, well, yeah, anyways, um, so my question. So what's the 
the biggest thing that's slowing down projects like ITER from getting like completed and, and so forth? Like what's the, and so what's the biggest hurdle to these things? I've heard of, I've heard um, lots of different things, like including the fact that you have to, you know, make the material, the, use, use the material so that, you know, so that they don't accumulate defects or that you have to like fix it or something. Or there's of course what you were mentioning with the, the plasma instabilities and so forth. But in, from, from your perspective, what's the biggest thing that's slowing it down? You know, uh, building the concrete building in which ITER exists has taken over a decade. Um, concrete isn't a lost art. Um, it has to have lots of rebar in it and it has to be special nuclear concrete, but it's still remarkable that it takes that long to do. Um, it, it's about the risk that you're willing to take with that much money. When you, and I have a theorem, it's a, it's a silly theorem, it's a typical thing that physicists do, right? That up to about 100 million, you can do an experiment and above 100 million, you have to do a demonstration mm -hmm. because nobody's going to spend more than 100 million without an assurance of low risk. And that's why ITER is a very, very conservative design. And when they're building it, they're very, very conservative about all of the all, all of the elements of this. It took a long time to build a vacuum vessel. It's a piece of steel. And the insistence on, on very, very high precision makes it hard to build, but it's not you know, beyond the wit of, of people um, to do that. I, I, I worry that we've lost our, um, <clears throat> lost our appetite for risk and it makes innovation at this scale very, very hard to do. Um, at, a much, at, at a lower level of, of funding, you know, companies are willing to take risks. I mean, if you'd, <laughs> I, I remember watching the, the, the SpaceX rocket come down to land back on its, on, on its feet and topple over and, and, and fall. Um, if that happened in a government project, you know, everybody would lose their job. I think in SpaceX, people said, oh, well, we did, it didn't work, let's try again. Um, maybe a few people lost their jobs. Um, the, it, it's really about risk appetite and it really uh, holds things back. And this is one of the nice things about private companies like Commonwealth Fusion coming into this is that maybe their investors understand that they have to take a risk in order to move fast in you know, um, this kind of technology. Interesting, thank you so much. Uh, are there other questions? All right, um, good. Well, if there are no other questions, can we, uh, did I miss any questions? I believe there's two questions in the chat. Oh, um, okay. Uh, let's see. I can read. The, the first one is, what are some prominent theoretical open questions that are required to make real progress on fusion? <clears throat> the size of the device is determined by that turbulent transport. If you can reduce the turbulent transport, which we think we might be able to do with three-dimensional fields, um, you can reduce the size of the devices. The people use, with that formula with B, B squared and R cubed, people use a fudge factor uh, when they're not doing real calculations and they call it H. And that factor, when it gets big, it means that you've got lower turbulence. Um, so in the last decade, we've just understood how to calculate the turbulence. But what we haven't understood is how to, how to use those calculations to reduce the turbulence to make the fusion plasmas smaller. Um, and while turning up the magnetic field does make the plasma smaller, it would be really nice to do it in a really smart way, which would be to turn down the turbulence in the, mm -hmm. in the plasma. It says, what, what external heating methods will ITER use? ITER has two um, heating methods. One of them is what we call electron cyclotron heating. You send in microwaves at the frequency, well, actually two times the frequency at which the electrons go around the, 
with the magnetic field lines. And obviously the magnetic field varies in strength across the plasma, so it's at a particular point in the plasma. And you put the beam of microwaves goes through the plasma, and at that point gets absorbed by the electrons and you heat the electrons. And it's going to provide um, over 50 megawatts of, um, of electron cyclotron heating. Um, from gyrotrons that come mostly from Russia and, and Japan. Um, but th they're also going to use negative ion neutral beams. You can't send a beam of charged particles into the plasma because it's a, it's a magnetic field and they come straight back at you. Um, but what you can do and, um, is to send a, bomb of, a, a beam of neutralized particles into the plasma. And at some point in the plasma, the electron will get knocked off the atom and the two charged particles will be caught by the magnetic field. And so neutral beams, uh, have, we've been heating plasmas with neutral beams for 30, 40 years. Um, and TFDR had 40 megawatts of neutral beam power going into it at Princeton in the 1990s when it did 10 megawatts of, of fusion power. But when you get to ITER, the distance that the neutral beams, the normal neutral beams that we make, which are called positive ion neutral beams, you accelerate a positive ion you send it through a, some gas and a electron that's on hydrogen in the gas jumps from the atom and the hydrogen onto the moving ion and goes into the plasma but by in charge exchange. And that's a positive ion neutral beam. And they poop out at about 270 kilovolts um, because you can't get the electron to jump onto the moving ion as it's going by. And so uh, the way to, way to do uh, uh, neutral beams at energies above 270 kilovolts, which you need to penetrate the distance into, into ether, is to make negative um, uh, ions of deuterium or tritium, accelerate them with an extra electron on them, accelerate them on that, and then strip the electron off so that it becomes a neutral part and go into the plasma. And that's a technology that the Japanese have been developing for some years and is getting, getting quite good. And uh, ITER will have some 30 megawatts, I think, of, of negative ion neutral beams um, on it. Um, go with, and they're one, one megavolt beams. So they, go, they penetrate right to the middle of, of, of ITER. Did, uh, somebody asked if there been attempts at private funding for fusion. If so, what are the results? There's huge amounts of money flooding into fusion uh, startups at the moment. Two billion in the last five years. Um, the most prolific was is a company out of Irvine, California, called TriAlpha, um, which is trying to do proton boron fusion, which is where you fuse proton and boron eleven to, to make three alpha particles. Um, they have a, a scheme, and and they've been very well funded, some close to a billion dollars in in, in funding for TriAlpha. Um, Commonwealth Fusion, the, the one that's making Spark, um, which uh, is the closest to the sort of government funded uh, and you know, Tokamak programs. Um, that one, I, I think it's about 200 million in funding. Um, but there's numerous startups all over the place and, and, and people very eager to put their money into Fusion. Um, it's an interesting question how you make scientific judgments of, of their ideas. Um, I think it's really hard. <laughs> what do the richest persons in the world think about this? Some of them are putting their money into fusion. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, I, I, I don't know how to use chat. Can I get in the queue for a question? Go, go ahead, Bob. Yeah. So, uh, like a lot of us, I've looked at the ITER reports, and they look good. No, but the thing is, with magnetic fusion, they always look good until until um, you find something. Your um, the question is coming. So you put your finger on the point that this design has basically been de debugged by Jet already. And that, and that's the reason to be optimistic that there aren't any more skeletons to find. Now, here's my question. Suppose we're lucky and it works. What does the headline say? 
In other words, what you there's going to be a a, a a burn regime that's behaving as it should, and that um, the 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 stability is what you thought it should be, or maybe even better. And the duration of the uh, burn pulse is right on task, and so forth. So, what does the headline say the next day? Um. <clears throat> Well, it says the first controlled thermonuclear burn on Earth. And give us another $2 trillion. Um, I mean, I think the, 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 the real truth of that is it's a demonstration that fu a self-sustained fusion burn is possible. It's not a demonstration that fusion energy will ever be economic. And I think innovation has to come before it's economic. Um, there's a, there are a number of issues which you probably know very well, Bob. You know, like yeah. what do you make the walls of? Um, sure. So okay, so you, that's your answer. This is your talk, but I'll let me throw in my two cents worth. Okay. Right? Um, I really have my fingers crossed on this because the design is so conservative. Um, I think it would be an electric moment because we've been waiting half a century and there have been problem after problem after problem and you know understandably uh anyway i'm uh that's what i guess and i'm so i, I i'm uh, i'm really hoping that um the page will be turned if i certainly for me bob you know to sit in the control room and watch it burn yeah uh, would be a would, would be an in incredible moment, and I think it will make people believe that there is there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I agree with. You. But you know, I'm not in the business just to burn the plasma. I'd love to see some electricity. <laughs> right, so cool. What are the plans for NSTXU? I didn't talk about the device that we're finishing uh, building at, at, at Princeton because it's a it's a compact version of an axisymmetric device. Um, and we're the, uh, we've got about um, another 12 months of uh, construction to go on a, on a compact device. It, it's trying to reduce the turbulence by a number of, 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 of ways in order to make a much more compact um, uh, topmac. And uh, we're getting there. Um, we had the coils delivered. Um, we're the, they're the machining the, the, the some of the vacuum vessel at, at, at this point, and so we'll be there. Um, the, not this summer, but the summer afterwards, will be um, visits from that device. Um, okay, maybe uh, I don't see any more questions. So, so why don't we thank? Steve for both an extremely interesting and inspiring talk. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Steve, are you still there? I am. Uh, I have a question. I'm sorry. Um, tell me about, if you go to more compact devices, there's going to be much more neutron damage in the materials problems. Yeah. And, and, and um, can you comment on that? Yes. So one of the big questions, if we go to a pilot plant, is how long, how much materials research do you need in order to guarantee that the materials will last long enough to make it worth building the first wall? Um, whatever the pilot plant has to, you have to have a replaceable first wall, because at you know one megawatt per square meter, you get um, ten displacements per atom per year. And, and in a device like the Spark one from, or the Arc one, which is the, the reactor on the MIT design, um, we're talking like four uh, megawatts to six megawatts per square meter of wall, which means 40 to 60 uh, DPA per full power year. Um, we're not sure that steels will hold up after 30 uh, displacements per atom in the, in, in the wall. 
Um, we don't know that they won't, but we don't know that they will. And so my, my view of if you build a pilot plant is you have to build it with a replaceable wall. And this puts constraints on the engineering, which is one of the reasons why uh, we're very keen on using permanent magnets as the trim, and then a few high temperature superconducting coils to provide the rest of the field, because you can demount permanent magnets and pull them out and get to the blanket and the first wall structure and move it out. You may have to replace the first wall every few years. And if, if it takes you two years to replace the first wall every three years, then you're never going to make commercial power. So uh, this is one of the reasons that I'm not terribly keen on going to high power densities for the first generation of, of devices. It doesn't make sense. We should, we should make sure that the aging of the wall is, is long enough that we have time to do the technical tests um, to get the materials right. Can't you have something flowing slowly down the wall? You can, and, and we do talk about having lithium on the walls um, in order to particularly, but, but it's more a thin layer. And the neutron mean free path of 14 MeV neutron is a few centimeters into the wall. And so um, uh, the, the, real, the real danger is that that first piece of wall before you go into the blanket and the damage on that first piece of wall. Um, people are talking about oxide dispersion steels, which have a little um, little uh, oxide particles, um, ceramic-like particles inside the steel, where the helium that you that you make from the um, from the 14 MeV damage um, it accumulates, so that it doesn't produce bubbles along grain boundaries and weaken the steel. Uh, but nobody knows the aging properties of those those steels under a 14 MeV neutron bombardment. Um, there's a proposal for to build a point neutron source um, to test those uh, materials, but it's a very expensive device to test a few centimeters cubed of um, of wall material. I think it would be better to try and focus on the engineering of a device in which you could take the wall out put new bits of wall in. I've always been impressed that the fuel rod is quite a clever design in that you can take it out when the cladding of the fuel rod is, has aged too much to be strong enough and put in a new fuel rod um, and uh, while you're working the, the reactor. Um, and I think we need to look for engineering designs on the first wall and blanket of fusion that are similarly sort of replaceable. All right, last chance, any other questions? All right, good. Let's, uh, let's thank Steve again. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye, thank you. <clears throat> okay.